You're listening to the Visionary Lifestyle Podcast, the show that's dedicated to raising consciousness and empowering you to activate your highest potential. I'm your host, Magda Freedom Rod. Greetings, Rainbow Warriors. How's everybody doing? I know it's been a while since I've published an episode, and I'm so grateful for your patience. I am coming to you today from the south of France where I'm currently just north of the magical and powerful Pyrenees and just about wrapping this round of my pilgrimage to Mary Magdalene. Now, as I've dived into her teachings, I'm learning that I've been teaching many of the same things and it's blowing my mind. I feel such a strong resonance with her story and her energy. I hope you're following my Instagram account where I've been sharing lots on my feed and my daily stories about the journey and all the sacred sites I've visited. Check that out on Instagram at visionary underscore lifestyle underscore guide. So guys, this pilgrimage to the divine feminine has been life-changing. I'm finally understanding why I've been called to Paris and the south of France for over three decades. <laughs> I've discovered that Mary Magdalene spent a significant part of her life here in France and that Paris is actually named for the goddess Isis and that Mary Magdalene was trained as a priestess in the temple of Isis. Now it's said that beneath Notre Dame in the very heart and center of Paris is a temple of Isis. So check the name guys, Paris, par ici, Paris. Par in French is the word P-A-R, it means four, so it's like four Isis. So this is why it's so significant that Notre Dame burned recently. This event can be interpreted as a literal blowing off of the roof of the patriarchy that has been dominating most religions and the world for the last 2,000 years. So the time of the divine feminine is upon us. It's undeniable. Women are rising up like never before to claim their place in the world and deliver their gifts in service to Mother Earth and all her creatures. This is the Shakti force that is turning the tides here on planet Earth right now. I'm writing about this a lot, so you'll be the first to know when my two books are ready. And stay tuned for my upcoming season on Shakti Power with interviews with some of the most intriguing female leaders and activists of our time. Guys, the Dalai Lama has said that the Western woman will save the world. And I'm bringing you some stellar examples of these women who are living their lives in service to the greater good. And this, my beloveds, is what brings me to today's guest, as she is one of these women. Let's welcome Amisha Gadiali. She's an award-winning social entrepreneur whose career has included demanding roles in the political, sustainability, and tech startup worlds. She has combined managing a high-pressure lifestyle with her deep knowledge of sustainable living, mindfulness, and yoga. Her knowledge and experience in different industries makes it easy for her to connect to your daily world and bring that extra illumination which makes it all flow. Her own burnout while trying to save the world led her into training as a yoga and meditation teacher which in turn opened a giant rabbit hole deeper into the mystical realms. In addition to over 1,000 hours of teacher training in yoga and meditation, she's trained as a priestess, Reiki master, and intuitive energy healer. She brings all this depth and her fascination with the relationship of our inner and outer worlds to her work. Amisha is also a writer and speaker on all aspects of conscious and green living. She edited the collaborative book, The Future is Beautiful, coining the term creative activism and bringing together ideas and artwork from over 200 contributors to inspire a brighter future. She's recently launched a membership portal called The Presence Collective and also has a podcast titled The Future is Beautiful. I see Amisha as an eco-warrior and visionary activist. Amisha's like a rainbow, like me, with loads of interests and projects happening all at once. I met her at Bali Spirit Festival a couple years ago now and continue to watch her from afar as she makes valuable contributions to the collective. So in this conversation, we'll be discussing mystical healing, saving the world, visionary activism, the environment, eco-fashion, and even a little bit of politics. So make sure to check the show notes to links to all of her projects. And now 
on with the show. Enjoy and namaste. Amisha Gadiali, welcome to the show. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. At long last. <laughs> a year later. Yeah. We met here in Bali a year ago and, and tried to make this happen. And I was just thinking about it. I was shopping um, for some groceries a little bit earlier. And I was thinking, this is so in divine flow. And you texted me, oh, I'm going to be a little late because my last appointment was a little late. And I thought, no big deal. It's, it's in the flow. Whereas last year we tried so hard to make it happen and it, it didn't flow. And I'm just no. appreciating and recognizing that. We're in the flow now and how good that yeah. feels. Well, I had parasites. <laughs> Is that what it was? Yeah, That was part of it. But I didn't know I had them. And so I was oh. trying to figure out what, why I was so tired and what was happening. Oh, wow. And um, I just kept feeling exhausted. And then um, I found actually some really great support here in Bali and cleared out my system. Ah, oh, much better now, huh? I'm, yeah, I'm much better now. Okay. Well, <laughs> and everyone has parasites, but those parasites had gone a little bit out of control. They Everyone went, has parasites? From what I understand, um, not Yikes. being a parasite expert, okay. <laughs> is that every human being does have parasites in their body. Hmm. But uh, mostly they're there and you don't notice and they don't do that much harm. Um, you know, because of all the sugar that we eat and mm -hmm. because of all the world travel and the, how dirty the water is, you know, all of these different things means that we have them. Yeah, oh, well, that's scary to think about. Can we change the subject? <laughs> that's not what this show is about today. <laughs> but that just planted a seed that <clears throat> makes me want to explore that further at another time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I really want to have always wanted to sit down and have a conversation with you about is. Um, our, our shared passion for visionary activism. And um, you have quite a beautiful history with this. You've written a book about it, right? Mm -hmm. that, which is called the, F the Future is Beautiful. The Future is Beautiful, which is just such a visionary title. Let's, let's start there. What's that about? Well, that is a collaborative book. Mm -hmm. So it has over 200 uh, different voices in it. Oh, wow. And uh, it started because I was, I used to work in politics back in the, the day, I don't know when the day was, <laughs> a while ago. And I, we had an election in 2010 and I was thinking about how it was the first election in the UK in my lifetime that I was not excited about or engaged in the possibility of change through mm. it. So we had just kind of experienced the whole, um, 10 years, bef 13 years before we'd experienced the whole kind of new labor, like excitement and then, um, and then we'd realized that that wasn't what we thought it was. And, and so things were, things were kind of moving in this direction of everything being like the corporate interests and all of these different aspects affecting our politics. And I started to realize that more than, that now more than ever, what we, we can't trust a politician to be, or a political party to be the vehicle of the change that we want to see in the world, mm. of the creation of the future that we choose, mm -hmm. which is what we've done traditionally in democratic societies. Right. You say, okay, this person, this party has a vision of the future that it is my vision mm -hmm. or it's more or less my vision. So I give them my, my vote, my right. power, and, um, and they will go off and create it. And I realized that that wasn't the case. And that what, so more than ever, like we had to find a different way of creating the future that we choose for the world. Mm. And that that actually starts with having a vision. And it's such a simple thing, but most of us don't come into the world and survive through school and what not, and come out thinking, yes, I have, I have the right to have a vision of the world that I want to live in and strive to create it. And so what I did was I built a ballot box um, with, with the help of a carpentry artist friend. Mm -hmm. And we made these little ballot cards that said, the future I choose is dot, dot, dot. 
And in the run-up to that election, I went around all these different places and I asked people to vote with their vision of the future, tune in mm. what it was that they wanted to create in the world. And, and just giving that like permission to have a vision. Mm -hmm. And then that evolved uh, into a series of interviews called the Futures Interviews, where I would ask people to share their vision of the world that they want to live in. Uh, the project was initially called Think, Act, Vote. So they would share a think, a think being something that had inspired that vision. Mm -hmm. So it could be a personal story, something that happened in their own lives. It could be a, a film that they've watched mm -hmm. or a book that they've read, something that's really just gone, oh, like this, this mm -hmm. is what's important to me. Mm -hmm. And an act being something that we can all do in our daily lives that doesn't necessarily cost money, that's just a simple behavior shift. Mm -hmm. that's creating that vision and a vote being um, a something that exists in the world that we can support that's creating that vision mm -hmm. could be a political party nobody picked one generally an NGO or a campaign or a, or a business a, a social business that's creating something along those lines mm. and so I got people to share their answers to these questions and then also to share their future soundtrack, the one song they wanted to take with them into the future, um, and their five favorite web links of things that they thought were interesting and inspiring. And all of that came together in the book. So the book is a curated version mm -hmm. of all of those visions, inspirations, actions, um, and then ways of getting wow. involved. But it ends and it begins with the questions. Mm -hmm. and that whole book really exists so that anyone that comes into contact with it realizes that they can answer the questions themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that's really what it is. It's like, okay, like, and you, what is it that you right. want to create? Right. Oh, I love that. This is, this is the visionary work that we need to be doing. Thank you so much for stepping up and allowing that, that beautiful vision and project to channel through you. That's beautiful how it happens so organically as well, right? You didn't set out to write a book. It just, it happened, right? Yeah, and yeah. I didn't set up to um, start even that project. Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, between jobs and mm -hmm. I was applying for jobs and then this thing kind of started and sometimes when these th you, yeah. you just let them, they kind of yeah. keep going and da 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 and then like, yeah. yeah. You're, you're getting people in touch with their inner visionary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's so fitting to have you here on the Visionary Lifestyle Podcast because you are really living it, living it and being a leader in that space. And that's really inspiring to me. Thank you. You're also working um, in eco-fashion, right? Why, why is that important for us to be thinking about what we're wearing? Well, when I was working in politics and I, I realized that if I stayed working in politics, that uh, by the time I had any power, I probably wouldn't have any values mm. left. Oh. And I decided Ouch. to jump out. And, um, and I had always been interested in fashion um, and more in terms of creativity, expressing who you are. And, you know, I just, I really appreciate the beauty of the craft that is creating clothing and jewelry. Mm -hmm. And, when I kind of looked at what was happening in the fashion industry, it's like, wow, just a very simple thing. You and I are wearing clothes right now, and I imagine most people listening are wearing clothes. <laughs> <laughs> most. <laughs> and, and whatever it is that you're wearing has traveled through many hands, mm -hmm. many countries, and is made of the earth in some way. Mm -hmm. And an item of clothing really shows you what what world we're living in right now yeah and so from the simple thing like a t-shirt you realize how much we're polluting mm -hmm. the oceans we're polluting the land how much water we're using in production yeah. you realize shipping and all of these different things you realize about pesticides and the chemicals that were going into the land mm -hmm. you realize how badly people are being paid that are in all the different places of production across the whole cycle right and it goes all the way through 
write to like the magazines, which are also like, you know, running off interns mm -hmm. that aren't really being paid and like a kind right. of crazy energy. So you're like, wow, all of that is in my t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a real map of how we've created this modern world and all of the inequality and injustice in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that makes it also a really simple thing to bring your values to mm -hmm. and be like, okay, like what would it be like if I knew where my clothes came from, if I supported things that were made in a way where the human beings that were making the clothes were being paid a fair wage, mm -hmm. where chemicals weren't being poured into the earth and also into your skin when yeah. you're wearing mm -hmm. the clothing. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's really important because it's something that we can all engage in. Whether you like fashion or not, you're wearing clothes, you're part of this industry, mm -hmm. you're contributing to it. Right. Yeah, it's another place where people can really vote for the world that they want, right? Depending on where you buy your clothes. Absolutely. And, yeah, and being thoughtful and mindful and conscious about those choices as well. I was in the manufacturing business. I had a clothing line um, in 2006 when I saw An Inconvenient Truth. And that started me kind of on my activist role when I realized that the planet's really in trouble. And I, I started um, connecting the dots from there and realized that being in a production job in manufacturing, I, I was also, I mean, I did the whole brand. I was designing and everything as well. But I realized that through the production that I was doing, I was part of the problem. You know, I was really doing a lot of polluting and creating a lot of waste that was going into landfills and all of this. And so I had one more season. I did everything organic. And this was like back in 2006, 2007, where, you know, it wasn't so easy. And it's still not really because the, it, the industry still hasn't really caught up. And I remember learning that um, or not organic cotton, but conventional cotton was responsible for about 25% of the pesticides on the planet. Mm. And you look at cotton as like, it's marketed as this clean, white, pure fabric, right? Like it's yeah. fresh, it's 100% cotton, like it's clean, but it's one of the most toxic crops on the planet. And it's also responsible, as you may know, I imagine you know, in India, all the farmer suicides with the GMO cotton, right? It's over yeah. 100,000 farmers have committed suicide over this. So these are things to be thinking about when you make your clothing choices. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're shining a light on that. There's people really do need to be paying attention to that as well. Um, so what makes you such an activist? Is it, I mean, where does this come from? Is it this incredible mantra practice that you have? Because <laughs> this is something I just want to tell the audience that I got to really experience you and your very strong mantra practice at the Bali Spirit Festival when I st stepped into your mantras, mudras, meditation class. And wow, what a beautiful, loud, strong voice you have. And I, I'm happy to know that you're an activist as well. So you're using that beautiful, strong voice out in the world, you know, to call people forward for, ch for change, to call for change. So where does it come from in you? I, I imagine that your personal practice is, is a part of it. Um, my personal practice came in later, mm -hmm. actually as a way of supporting my activism mm. and fine tuning my activism so that it came from a loving place inside of me mm. and so that it wasn't me projecting mm -hmm. my stuff out of um through my activism so important so i came to it later okay um, after a colossal burnout okay trying to change the world and feeling like it was all my responsibility mm -hmm. and and the practices that that i do and that i share have allowed me to come into a space where I will rise up for what it is that I believe in, but I'm less attached to the outcome um, now. Mm. In fact, I'm actually not attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. like I, I'm accepting of where things are and I want to use my energy to shift them. Mm -hmm. But before I wasn't like that, I would take everything very personally. Mm -hmm. I would get very upset by things. And not that that's bad, because there's a lot to be upset about. Sure. But I feel like I've grieved. Like, mm. it's not that I, I use my practices to, um, to not feel. Mm -hmm. It's actually that I, I've grieved. I have expressed a lot of rage. Mm -hmm. The personal 
grief and rage, the, the, the grief and the rage at where we are in the world and mm -hmm. in society and where our values are. And then like the ancestral too, like, mm -hmm. and I've processed a lot of that through a lot of the work that I've, mm. the inner work that I've done. And that allows me to pick my battles mm -hmm. and to move into them like with discernment and with like a sense of kind of inner resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah powerful that's so important and I, I really would like to just hover for a moment on this idea of as activists where our motivation and where our inspiration is coming from because mm. um, when you talk about that it takes me back to the Occupy movement which was probably the height of my activism in terms of like boots in the street you know carrying signs and going to actions and things and and I witnessed so many people coming from an angry place and I created a yoga program and um, a meditation tent, you know, somebody donated a 10 person tent, we made it into a meditation temple and, and had daily yoga and was running around giving everybody green smoothies and stuff and said like, drop the pizza, let's have a green smoothie instead, you know, so that we can be fully activated from the right place so that when we do our work, it's, it's coming from the heart space really more mm. than anything. Um, although, yes, we, we can be justifiably angry right now with the way a lot of things are going in the world, but it's so important to bring it back to that personal responsibility and coming from the right place, which is the heart, right? Mm. And also to acknowledge that we can do that and sometimes we will drop back into a different space mm -hmm. and you know, we'll either give too much or we'll, you know, burn ourselves mm. out or we'll, we will get caught up in the story. And that's part of the process of being a human. Mm -hmm. And then we can pull back. Mm -hmm. And I definitely, yeah, I don't want it to sound like now I know and I do everything like mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. from this like deep rooted heart place. Yeah. I, that's where, that's my rooting now. Yeah. Like that's where I am. But I, I fall off it yeah. and I come back. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. That, that's your humanness. But now you have a new, you have a new toolkit, right? Yeah. That when, when you recognize that you've fallen off, you can bring yourself back with those practices that you've cultivated. That's beautiful. That's powerful. It's, this is important for people to think about as they're being activists. So what is that practice? What, the power of mantra. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and mudras. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in learning more and more about mudras and um, that was another thing that brought me to your class. I, I want to learn more about that. I feel like I, I haven't really been trained in that in, in my yoga teacher training and it's something that, that is speaking to me a lot more now. So what can you tell us about mudras and mantras? Mudras are energetic seals that you create through your body and, and postures of your hands. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, the... the your hands are said to be an extension of your heart. So the, the energy you, you can, you can, you know, if you just like go to your heart and then you're like, oh yeah, oh, my hands come out from my heart. Mm -hmm. um, the first day that I realized that I was quite impressed. That was, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I didn't know. It's a big realization. <laughs> There's a connection here. And I feel that's why we clap when we're applauding something because mm -hmm. we're kind of clapping from our heart oh. and it's expressing through our hands. That's nice, yeah. And so then what we do with our hands uh, creates these different energetic seals and I find that through a mudra the more and more that I've practiced them and fine-tuned my subtle energy to to respond to them that I'll just make a mudra and I will immediately feel the anchoring mm -hmm. of what that mudra brings up mm -hmm. in me and yeah that's what I love about mudras they they're like very kind of, yeah, they just anchor you and you can, and also you can bring your mudra, like whatever you're doing, you know, I'm just, I do mudras quite a lot, like not just when I'm meditating and mm -hmm. in my practice, but it's just walking down the street. Yeah. Even sometimes right? so sitting in a car or, mm -hmm. um, if I've just got a minute before something and I just want to tune into a certain kind of energy. Mm -hmm. So different mudras do different things. So that yana mudra that connects you to your wisdom. The, and that's, let's describe that's it since the, we're only the, on audio the here. The little, um, the thumb and the index fingers together mm -hmm. is the one that you see a lot. Yeah. Um, 
and then like Kali Mudra, it's the index fingers together, the left thumb over the right and the other fingers interlaced. Mm -hmm. And it's like this sort of discernment and you yeah. feel like the power of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Padma Mudra is a lotus where your little fingers and your thumbs come together and the rest of your hands are open. Mm -hmm. And you can feel that too. It's like you're catching something, you're mm. open to receive something. Mm. And so they each have their own flavor. Mm -hmm. And mantras, they, yeah, they've become a, a deep part of my own practice and one of my favorite parts of my practice. And I guess I was exposed to mantras my whole life. Um, I come from an Indian heritage and I didn't see my grandparents a lot as a child but when I did I would sit with them and they would be chanting and praying oh, that's great and I learned some of the mantras with them mm. and um, I you know have had mantras around me my parents listen you know as a kid they had all their records mm. and then the CDs and there would often be like music Indian you know music playing my whole life yeah I in my teens and early 20s like rejected all of that <laughs> and um, as teenagers do yeah and then um i was making a joke the other day then the americans sold me back my culture <laughs> <laughs> because you got into yoga in the west yeah <laughs> and um and i when i i remember going to india um this is like when i was really deep in the activism world. So I was doing Think Out Vote, the, the project for Future mm -hmm. is Beautiful. I was doing all this sustainable fashion stuff. I was at political conferences like mm -hmm. every weekend. I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. Yep. I felt like I had to do everything. I know that feeling. And, um, <laughs> and it wasn't all coming from a pure place. Some of it really was. Mm -hmm. And then mixed in with that was a need to be useful, to be seen, to mm -hmm. be recognized, to have a purpose like yep. that came from like a wounded place. Mm. And so both of those things were there, which made it so painful. Yeah. And I didn't know that they were both there. Um, I just thought that I cared too much, mm -hmm. which I did, but there was all this other stuff. And I remember going to India and if any of you have ever been to India, you will know that you can just be hanging out, buying a chai or trying on a sari or getting a coconut. And everyone in India likes to share their wisdom very freely. Mm -hmm. And there was this one time that I was in India and everywhere I went, people kept saying to me, you need to chant the Gayatri Mantra. This heaviness that you're feeling this will go if you chant the Gayatri Mantra every wow. day. And I was just, and it just kept happening on this one trip. Wow. I was like, okay. Yeah. And I remember thinking that's completely bonkers. <laughs> How could a mantra take away this deep pain and suffering that mm -hmm. I felt because the world is so awful. <laughs> and, um, and so I bought the CD with a mantra and I kept it in the packet for a, a while. And then oh. I started listening to it a little bit at nighttime, secretly, and and then I learned, so I was like, oh, this feels nice, actually. And, um, and then when I was getting more and more into yoga and, and, and you know, deeper into yoga, of not just going to a class, but actually kind of understanding what yoga really is. Yeah, walking the true of path of yoga. The poses mm -hmm. and spending more time with teachers than just an hour where you actually get to dive in and you get to experience the deeper aspects of the practice. Mm -hmm. I, as we started chanting, it was actually one retreat I went on where we chanted the Gayatri Mantra every day. And I remember thinking I would never be able to say all the words. And even though I'm from an Indian background, I don't speak... Indian lang languages. I speak like Gujarati, like a five-year-old, mm -hmm. and I can just say really silly things like "I'm hungry," "I'm tired," "My brother just hit me," that kind of yeah. stuff that I learned when I was <laughs> five a kid. Five-year-old stuff, yeah. But um, I, I can't. I'm not very sophisticated in it, and mm -hmm. so learning Sanskrit has been for me the same as for you, mm -hmm. and the same as if I was now to try and learn Russian. Like right. you know, it's like it's not, it's not been natural mm -hmm. on some level. 
But on another level, when I just allowed it and I took my mind out of it, then I found myself being able to chant the mantras. Mm. And actually, like in the workshop that you came to, mm -hmm. there were a lot of people there that had never chanted before. Nice. And I said, like, let's just go for it. And I'm not giving you the words to look at. Because I want you to just feel them and see if you know them. And then they're all chanting. It's, yeah. it's, some, it's kind of incredible how mm -hmm. that happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe they wouldn't then be able to chant them by themselves without seeing the words. But right. they can join in. And so I started chanting and then I, I got deep, deep in, deeper and deeper into my mantra practice. And I found that it connected me with my ancestry more than anything else. Mm. I would begin to feel the presence of my grandmothers especially wow. and I and and these different voices would come out and so when I first started chanting you know it'd be like um, dun, 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 dun. and then like when I just allowed yeah. it these voices would come out and I would literally be like, um, dum, dragain, amaha. and then I'd be like, whoa, who was that? You know, <laughs> and like, where did that just come from? And, and I realized that these energies of the mantras, the, the mantras wake up something inside of yourself that is already in there. And so the way that I understand it is that the, the, the mantra, the deity that the mantra is speaking to mm -hmm. is... An energy, it's just a name for an energy. So say so Durga, the one that I just shared, and she's very much the activist mm -hmm. goddess. Mm -hmm. She is a warrior and she is courage and she is deeply rooted in the power of love and her love and devotion. And she doesn't just go straight into battles. She goes, even though she could go into the battle, she goes into her cave and she chants and she meditates and she strengthens herself even more, even more. Mm. And she goes into the battle at the right time. Mm -hmm. She has an understanding that there is a right time. If you rush into something, then your arrow, it might like miss or uh -huh. it might cause more, more repercussions that mm. you don't want. Mm -hmm. And so she's very, you know, very clear okay, now, now this is the time to go in mm -hmm. where I can be as effective as mm -hmm. possible. And, it, and it's all this, this warrior power is built on this deep sense of love. And that has a voice, in, you know, inside right. of each Powerful one of us. Voice. And yeah. that is in ourselves. Mm. And that's the beautiful thing about mantra is you just wake it up. Mm -hmm. and, and when you chant, like, you know, we did the other day with, I'm not very good at guessing how many people were in a space, but like a hundred people. Right. It, you, it's like, yeah. <laughs> like you know, it's a lot of power that, in that. That energy field is very strong. Mm -hmm. And I have found that, you know, the word mantra comes from the Sanskrit word manas, which is mind. And it, it mm -hmm. actually is a practice to dissolve out of the mind space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it is powerful. I, how, much time do you spend on your personal practice with mantra now? My personal practice at the moment is uh, in a, I'm going through, I go through spaces of like discipline mm -hmm. and like I'm doing this for this many minutes, for this many days, da da mm -hmm. da da The moment I'm in a place of saraja, which is water rises. Mm -hmm. and, and so I sit and I, you know, I have my mat and I, I just allow whatever it is that I want, that mm -hmm. I feel, mm -hmm. um, and I go for it. Yeah. And so I don't sit for a certain number of minutes every okay. day. Okay. Um, I, but I love to chant every day. Yeah. And I would quite happily sit and chant for hours. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and something that I'm... I, my understanding and attraction to mantra is something that's been evolving... Um, much more actively since I started this podcast and I interview people and have these conversations and you know I've interviewed several teachers and um, it's really activated my interest in it and I, I, I started out and I, ju I just want to hold myself accountable for my, my comments in the past where saying that in the beginning when I started being introduced to mantra I was very resistant to it because I didn't know what they were saying and it was always mm -hmm. really frustrating to me to be invited to 
um, chant and share something that I didn't understand what I was saying. It's like, what am I invoking? What am I confirming, you know, affirming? And I was always really uncomfortable with that. But a good, you know, year plus later, after finally developing my own personal practice and really enjoying it, what I'm, what I'm coming to, to terms with is that it's not really even about the words. It's about the energy. And like you said, not wanting to give your students the words because their eyes are just going to be on the paper and they're going to be disconnected from the energy mm. of it. And I think that's so important. But I'd say that you have the perfect combination of teaching style because you did interpret it and you did tell people what you're saying. You did explain it before they started. And I noticed that and I really appreciated that. But then also the not giving them the words and just inviting them to be in the energy of it. So like full package and mm. good job. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I've had the same thing. Like I, uh, I don't like to just be in a practice where it's like, okay, now you do this, and it's all very mechanical. Like I do want to understand why, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily from that place of like the mind questioning everything, but mm -hmm. it's kind of from a place of honoring the ritual. Like I don't want to just say Om at the beginning of class and Namaste at the end. Like I want to revere those things because mm -hmm. I understand their place and mm -hmm. why they're there and mm -hmm. why we're doing that mm -hmm. and and I as a teacher that that is how I like to teach I don't like to teach anything that I don't understand mm -hmm. and as a student I would find that annoying like mm -hmm. if and and I think you can tell when a teacher doesn't really know why they're doing something mm -hmm. and it feels a bit mm -hmm. and I've, I've had this conversation with one of my teachers because we were actually on a silent retreat together um, with another teacher and there was a mantra and I went and wrote you could ask questions on paper and I went and wrote you know what is does this mantra mean and I get and you know and then they gave me the translation and you know I was the only person out of these hundreds of people on this silent retreat that, that asked that and my teacher caught me doing that and she she kind of was like I knew that that would be you <laughs> like, <laughs> I knew it that. was you <laughs> um, and we had an interesting conversation because it's like well, when you're really tuned into subtle energy uh, do you need to know like what something means because you can just feel what it means and yes I agree with that on some level but I do work as an intuitive therapist which is I work one-on-one -on -one with people clearing their subconscious patterning and I could just work on them and be like da -da 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 -da, jing done mm -hmm. and then it's like well how's that compared and they would feel it right mm -hmm. they feel everything move mm -hmm. but when i tell them what i'm doing i tell them like okay i see this trauma pattern and it looks like this and it feels like this and they're like oh boom i feel it and i'm like okay are we ready to release it and we release it mm. and then when i say like okay you know we're gonna now awaken like the quality of self-worth in an embodied way through your energy field like here can you feel it and they feel it and then they know that that's the seed that they've got to go and integrate over the next mm -hmm. like couple of months that's a much stronger experience right and it brings it brings them more into the practice it makes it a collaborative thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh it takes away from this like me being healer teacher right like magic maker right to like know like this, empowering we're them. communicating mm -hmm. in a different language yeah. and I'm teaching you this language as we go right and for me that's really powerful and I find that like yes you can get stuck in in the mind and that so there's a reason for not knowing things so that you can feel them but if you can learn how to use your mind your conscious mind to help you tap deeper into your feeling state and your unconscious mind mm -hmm. then that's when your real power comes alive and that's what i want to do with my work yeah beautiful the world really needs as many people as possible out there helping people reprogram their subconscious habits right because what, what is there a percentage that you're familiar with i've heard 85 to 95 percent were run by our subconscious is yeah that... that's bruce lipton right yeah, yeah. well i yeah. think bruce says 95 and then someone else i was talking to in a recent interview said 85 but Either way, it's a you lot. know, that's a lot, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I know I interviewed Bruce for like an hour and a half and, and I, I kept trying to get to, and how do we fix it? And how do we fix it? You know, and at the yeah. end, uh, the tool that we came up with was um, about um, recording your own voice, you yeah. know, and listening to that in your theta state when you're waking up and when you're going to sleep and using that as a 
powerful way to reprogram yourself. So I wasn't aware that you were doing that work. What, what does that look like? I mean, what is it theta healing? What do you call that? Um, I mean, I call it intuitive therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I also call it energy healing, mm -hmm. but I don't like the word healer because of this this thing of taking out the responsibility, the joint responsibility. Mm. Um, and, and because I don't think that I am like magic or special, I've just really gone on a mission to clear as much of my stuff as mm -hmm. I can and come into as much of my intuitive state of being as I can. Mm -hmm. And... I think we can all do so much more when we get to that place and that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I did my Reiki master um, many years ago and I didn't practice because I was still drinking a lot and like in the, you know, doing my like trying to save the world stuff, mm -hmm. um, but I was interested in energy and subtle energy. Um, and then I met uh, a teacher, um, a mystic and you know, we spent time together and he just nudged me to, to, um, open up my own way. Mm. And I discovered my own way of doing it. Um, and, and it, I li it is literally like, I work with someone, I see, I, you know, I close my eyes, I see layers of their subconscious. One at a time, we go through different layers. I will see like a picture, I will explain what it is and it will be like, okay, like, you know, you're in a room, you're five years old and everyone's having a great time and you feel like you can't join in and you're sitting by yourself. And then we'll release like the trauma of the fear of not having anything to say, of not being accepted, of whatever these programs are, we'll mm -hmm. just release them one by one. Mm -hmm. And then in that space, it's like, we all have these bags of seeds of, of our human potential. Mm -hmm, and, it's, mm -hmm. and it's all of the normal stuff and then it's all of the mystical stuff, right, too. Yeah. And, and then in that space, it's like, yeah, we just go into that, those bags of, of this, your seeds, the person mm -hmm. that I'm working with, mm -hmm. and we just plant those seeds and they get an embodied, uh, embodied reference point of what that is. Oh, because beautiful. if you... If you haven't got self-worth, like you just never had self-worth, and this used to be me, so I know this one really well, mm. that you go on a course and you have it for like a few days afterwards, or you read a book and you have it for a couple of hours afterwards, right. and then it just drains out of your system mm -hmm. because it's got nothing to root to onto. Root, yeah. And I don't know how I can do this work, um, it's best not to inquire too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I sit down at the beginning like, and I think maybe it won't work this time because I don't have like a, this is the process and this is the formula and da da da. It's like, I just feel and I sense. And so far I've been doing it for a number of years and so far it's always hit where it needs to go mm -hmm. and whatever that person's ready to shift in that moment has shifted. Mm -hmm. And you know, they go home with their list of their seeds and then it's up to them to really root them. And, you know, when we were at the um, International Yoga Festival last year mm -hmm. um, and Bruce Lipson was speaking and it was the first time I heard him speak and I was like, wow, this actually gave me a scientific understanding of what I'm doing because huh. I didn't know. Oh, wow. And exactly. And then when he explained it, I was like, huh, that's what I'm doing in these sessions. Mm -hmm. It's making more sense now, right? When you understand the biology of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't come to me through biology. It came to me through a mystic in a tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even better. Even better. And then the science is there to help explain it. Yeah, exactly. Um, which a lot of people need that scientific explanation, right? There's so many people that are skeptical about the mystical thing. So whatever it takes to get someone into the room to do the healing, right? Yeah, and I was one of those people too. I, I touched on, I've touched on so much mysticism in my life. Like, I've had all these near-death experiences where like, I don't really understand how I survived them and wow. the, there are mystical things going on and I've always like sensed things and you know rooms that I just can't sleep in because there's ghosts in there, all this different stuff. It's happened my entire life. But I've, I was so in this like, 
this story that like this stuff isn't real and it's not cool. Mm -hmm. I was, it was definitely like, you know, it's cool to like not really care about the stuff and not really be connected and mm -hmm. like and where mm -hmm. I was coming from and to drink a lot and uh, to, and I think I was actually escaping the intensity of what I was experiencing and feeling. Mm. And, you know, I kept having experiences and then kept like kind of being like, well, that was, that was really amazing. And then blah, blah. Um, and then it wasn't until I just had this moment where I just opened up and one of the, one of the, the things that happened that year was I was in, uh, I went to visit Amma's ashram mm -hmm. and the hugging mother yep. and I just watched her for hours and she didn't go to the toilet or yeah. drink any water mm -hmm. and that was, and I watched her for hours and hours and hours, not drink any water or go to the toilet and keep hugging people. Yeah. And for some reason, that was the day that a whole load of my cynicism melted away. And I was like, <laughs> okay, there's something else going on here because oh, any Allah. human would have needed the toilet by now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and obviously she's a human, but she's a obviously, human now, but she's sure. open up to, to something else. And that moment gave me permission to open up to something else fully. Mm -hmm. Oh, she does it again, Amma. I just spent three <laughs> weeks there at the beginning, yeah, of, uh, well, some months ago now. I started my India, my three months in India there. I spent oh, three weeks beautiful. at her ashram and got a bunch of hugs and definitely had my powerful moments with her as well. So I always want to encourage people to go see her because she is one of these beings that doesn't seem quite human, right? Mm. When she is such an inspiration in terms of being of service to humanity. So yeah. that's nice to know, to know that she inspired you that and, way. And a powerhouse because of, you know, they're making all these like organic products. They're, they're raising all this money. Yeah. They're getting, Amma gets into like a disaster zone quicker than any governments and NGOs mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure about the inner circle and mm -hmm. like I get a little bit like Ugh! With, with like the hardcore devotees. It's mm -hmm. not my scene, I guess. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I enjoy uh, and I, I receive the humility from all of these teachers mm -hmm. and I want to keep coming back to myself yeah. and to understand you know, what is the, what is the, the uniqueness, the unique expression of creativity that is coming through me? Mm -hmm. And I feel that's true with everyone that, that we meet. So I feel like with, with any teachers and gurus, it's like, yeah, enjoy them and don't get lost in their, in their story. Like stay true right. to finding your own. Ultimately be your own guru. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we agree on that. Well, thank you so much for finally, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad we finally got the time um, to connect and sit down and have this conversation and, and do it in a format that people, it could be shared with other people. And um, it's my intention for people to be inspired by what mm. you're role modeling and you're doing so many things. I mean, I, every time I sit down and listen to you or talk to you, I, I learn more about more projects and more things. And it just seems like you, you have a lot of output. So I see why you do get burnt out from time to time. Because <laughs> you really are an active activist. So I just really want to acknowledge you for that. And thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like this, the, I, I have, I've struggled with this thing in my life of being interested in different things. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of people, just be really careful what people tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a lot of people tell me that I wasn't focused and I was doing too many things and da 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 da. And now I'm 35. So I've now tried a lot of things and I've tried a lot of the ways that people told me that mm -hmm. I needed to try. And I've come into this place of being able to listen now to my own inner wisdom and my own intuition. Mm -hmm. And what I realize is that part of what I'm here to do is to weave between these different roles mm -hmm. and actually these different worlds that we create. We create these big silos for some reason in society. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're in this gang, you're in that gang, you care about this, you care about that. And mm -hmm. if you care about this, then you don't care about that. And, and I found that really frustrating because I feel like that's part of the problem that we have with where we are right now. 
I hang out with people that are in politics and there's so much interesting stuff that they're talking about and it could be so enriched by understanding what's happening in the spiritual circles. Mm -hmm. It can be so enriched by understanding what's happening in the sustainability world, in the um, understanding the environment and that can be so enriched by being deep, more deeply tapped into our creativity and out mm -hmm. of our heads. And, and so I feel like my role is, is that weaving together of those different threads Mm -hmm. It's like permission to be more human, to have all these different aspects of yeah. us alive mm -hmm. in ourselves, in everything that we do. Yeah. And actually we do it, like, we do it in our lives, in our kind of day-to-day -day lives, you know, the bits of our lives that don't really count. The fact that you have to, like, fix a shelf in your house, or you mm -hmm. have to, you know, if you've got kids, you've got to be able to, like, help with this homework and mm -hmm. deal with this tantrum. And you have to have all these different skills that mm -hmm. you weren't trained in. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, with our jobs and with our hobbies and interests you're not allowed to have too many mm. and and I think that cuts out our potential and I you know definitely going d there are some people that are designed to go very deep deep right. deep into one thing yep. and there are other people that are designed a different way and where I come alive is this you know I went I was this activist that got really burnt out and turned to my practices Mm -hmm. think to recharge to pa planning on going back to my activism and then then there were you know there was another plan laid out for me <laughs> and it was like no you have to actually share all this stuff too mm -hmm. and then I was sharing all that stuff for a little while and I was like this feels really um material spiritually materialistic mm. um because now I'm surrounded by all these people and we're all wearing our fancy leggings and we're all like in our bliss <laughs> and like and I was like, Ugh, like, you know, and I was There's like, no, more than this. my yeah. role is like, how do we do this work on ourselves yeah. so that we can shift our own patterns, mm -hmm. come into like more authenticity with who we are, be more in our hearts and be part of the world that we're in mm -hmm. and use all of that to all of that work with our hearts to rise up and to contribute to the world that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. So that now you're at the festivals giving these talks about activism to the yogis and the fancy leggings and you are weaving it all together. And I, and I recognize that and I, I applaud that. And um, we're very much the same and on the same track with this. It's, it's once, once we're awake, once we're on this yogic path and we are awakening, it is important to bring awareness to how important it is, especially for the yogis. Like mm. use that throat chakra, use that vishuddha and you know, you're, you're cultivating it, you're cleansing it, you're opening it. It's there for a reason, you know, yeah. use it for good, right? Absolutely. Use it for more yoga, for more union in the world. And I totally relate to you about being a, a multifaceted human where we have all these diverse interests. When I had my store, after my clothing line, I opened an eco store and um, I wanted to support all these conscious companies and I couldn't pick one direction for it. It was the one-stop eco chic boutique because I carried everything under the sun that that with that one common thread which was sustainability and consciousness mm -hmm. so I totally relate to you on that and, and then yes there are some people who are wired to go deep in one specific thing and that's all perfect right so what you're talking about is um, being a holistic being right you have mm -hmm. your your practice and all these diverse interests and and weaving them together it's it's a beautiful picture that you're painting <laughs> and I also go into that other world where people wear shoes and <laughs> <laughs> I, I wear shoes and I, I wear smarter clothes uh -huh. um, not that much smarter um, I just dress uh, the same clothes but shoes. with shoes and um, <laughs> and you know and I give talks and work with people that are coming from a more headspace right and so you're the brave in the yoga and the yeah it's just so critical as well because if we just stay in the cave meditating it's not it's going to help you know it's going to help some but we could probably be more useful out in the world sharing those practices with people who are not even aware that they exist much less practicing them right yeah so yeah so you're being the, the rainbow bridge as well as as a, a master weaver <laughs> what made you stop doing your clothing and in, in the store um well, the, the clothing stopped for a couple of reasons. One, the bubble was bursting. It was 2007, 2008, and a lot of my stores were closing. The stock market was crashing, and I would put all the energy and effort and money and investment of time and energy and money into creating the orders, and it was blood, sweat, and tears. All the gray hairs I have are from those years in my life. 
And, um, and then the stores were closing and, and the bounces, the boxes were bouncing back to me and I had a warehouse full of, you know, clothes that I had made that I wasn't getting paid for. So that was one. And then also it was during that same time I had just seen an inconvenient truth and I was starting to awaken to there's a greater purpose for my life than this. And all my messages were always very uh, active. You know, it was, I built it as peace, love and rock and roll. It was children's wear I was designing because it started when my daughter was a baby. But, um, it was always conscious. The messages were always conscious, but um, I didn't want to be a part of that waste stream anymore. And then so I, I went to the Green Festival in San Francisco and I saw a huge convention center full of conscious companies and conscious products. And it was right on the heels of an inconvenient truth and that awakening that I had. And I said, oh, this is what needs attention now. So let me just open a platform and we get a store where I can highlight all of this. And it was through that store that I, um, I created a mobile store. I took an old Airstream and did a green renovation on that and took it around to festivals and things and just kept, kept meeting more conscious, awakened people. And that just, it took me out of the retail kind of selling stuff path. And I, I switched from, from products to services. You know, where can I be of service? And that's where service became really important to me. So always everything I do is with that underlying thread of consciousness and being of service. Hmm, beautiful. Yeah. That's that nutshell story in a nutshell <laughs> of a good decade of my life, but that's how things evolved. But yeah, that, the consciousness, I really can pinpoint the seeing, seeing that film, The Inconvenient Truth, and just about the environmental destruction of the planet and just you know coming out of that theater going, somebody's got to do something. What are we doing about this? Who's, who's, who's on it? We all need to be on it. You know, and I had a young child at the time, so it was all about preserving the planet for her and, and all the future generations along with her and after her, you know? And when you become a mother, for me, that's where it, it really initially started when it was suddenly wasn't about me anymore, you know? And it was like, what's gonna be best for her? Forget about me, I'm not gonna be here that much longer, but she has to grow up on this planet. And so that's, it got me outside of the me consciousness and took me from me to we consciousness. This is an example of how children make us, you know, better people. Mm. I'm grateful to her. I'm really eternally grateful to her for coming into my life. She took me to yoga. I went started prenatal yoga with her, you know. So she's, she has been a huge teacher for me and a huge guide for me. And so, so grateful for her. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So any, any last comments um, for the people? Uh, maybe what's one practical thing that, that people can do either... Um, with a personal practice, a sadhana, a mantra, or from an activism standpoint, what's the one important thing um, that you would advise to people? <laughs> so one of those like, oh, and you're like, wow, <laughs> one thing. I know, it's hard to, there's so many, right? But what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's this thing of tuning into your own vision. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on in the world and you can't be part of all of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make choices. And mm -hmm. to make choices, we have to know what our values are. And to know our values, you need a vision. And, and so, yeah, I recommend like answering this question, like what is the future that you choose? What does the world that you want to live in look like? And just sitting with that quietly mm. and seeing what emerges. Mm -hmm. And then using that, as a blueprint for what, where you put your, your time, your energy, your money, like that's mm -hmm. how we're creating the world. And this is the thing, we're all creating the world, whether we realize it or not. Mm -hmm. So even if you think that you're not, whatever you're doing, whether it's like just watching TV or whatever, that's energy that's, that's creating the future in that direction. So we all need to be like, okay, like what, what is it? That, how do I want my energy to be part of this creation? Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah, that's it. And then learning to slow down and be a bit quiet. Because that's when the wisdom really comes in. Mm -hmm. And when things are like, I, it's been a hard one for me because I, a lot, I want to do a lot. Like, mm -hmm. And a lot of ideas come really fast. Right. And, um, and so that thing of just slowing it, it all down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having time for the wisdom to come. I love that. And it, it is such an important thing to do every day, right? Um, you just reminded me, this is such a beautiful full circle moment for me. I just, you just reminded me of what has been a guiding quote for my visionary. I, I founded Visionary in 
must have been 2007 when I opened my store. It was the Visionary Lifestyle. And, and then it was the Visionary Boutique. But it's always been visionary about this third eye visioning. And mm. there was a quote that came across my awareness at that time. And I made it into a huge font and had it on, on the wall in my store. And it's in my um, mission statement and everything that I do for Visionary Lifestyle. And you're really embodying it. And this is what you're sharing with people. So I just want to share this quote. Um, it was discovered on a church in Sussex, England in, I forget what year, many hundreds of years ago. Um, but it goes like this. A vision without a task is but a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery. A vision and a task is the hope of the world. Hmm. Right? So it's not just about being a visionary. It's about following that up with action. Yeah. So it's exactly what you're talking about. Yes. I'm going to go on a little pilgrimage when I get back to England and, just, and go and find the church. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Report back. I will. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful we finally got this time together. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. And can I share that the book is free, actually. Yes. The ebook mm -hmm. of The Future is Beautiful is completely free to download. Oh, great. And so anyone can download it. And then you can buy hard copies. Obviously, they're not free because... Mm -hmm. um, There's costs involved. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but where do people go for that? Thefutureisbeautiful.co. And I have a podcast, uh, The Future is Beautiful, which I started last year. Fantastic. Uh, exploring the, this weave. Oh, beautiful. Okay, we will link to all of that in the show notes, guys. So this is one. Make sure you visit the blog post and go to the show notes and click all the clicks and, and find Amisha and follow her and all the amazing work that she's delivering onto our beautiful earth. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you for all that you're bringing. I can't help it. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. Today's episode is brought to you by the Conscious Eating 101 e-course. This is a six-week online course aimed at empowering you to make food choices that are in alignment with your values. The program is based on Ahimsa, also known as non-harm, and helps you make every bite that you take an expression of love, self-love, animal love, and planet love. The course offers 15 lessons and 20 nutritious and delicious recipes and is offered over six weeks that you can do at your own pace. It includes lessons like plant-based nutrition, protein, dairy alternatives, the story on sugar, GMOs, label reading, and many more. If you're looking to increase your health and happiness, balance your weight, reduce your footprint on the planet, and align your food choices with your values, or are interested in being part of the solution to huge world problems like climate change, rainforest destruction, and world hunger, then this is the course for you. If this speaks to you, please check out ConsciousEating101.com today. Thanks so much for answering the call to be here today. I'm so glad you're part of our tribe of activated rainbow warriors. If you found the show in any way empowering or inspiring, I would be so grateful if you would share the show on social media or with friends and family that you think would benefit from these conversations. And also, rate and review the show in iTunes. This is really the very best way to help support the show and help us get noticed by others who are looking for the sort of content that we're sharing. Now notice there are no outside ads playing here. That's because the show is supported by you, the listener. You can become a patron of the show with a small monthly donation by checking out the perks on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash visionary lifestyle and signing up there. There's also a one-time donation button on the podcast page of the website if that suits you better. And just so you know, your donations help to cover the necessary out-of-pocket monthly expenses to produce the show and will also help us grow so we can inspire and educate even more people. And hey tribe, I'd love to hear from you. Visit me at visionary-lifestyle.com and please tell me your comments and questions. I really look forward to connecting with you. I love you. Namaste. Namaste.